Well, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing today? Hey, before we begin the message today, I just want to uh, make note of something. You know, Monday, we celebrate the life of a great leader in this nation. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was raised up, I believe, by God to bring about resolution to some of the greatest ills and issues that were dividing our nation. But how many of you know, even though we've made progress, there is still more yet to be done? I would ask if you would with me today, you know, we're in a time of prayer and fasting, and this is one of my prayers I'd ask you to join with me about, is that God would raise up another leader in this day. Just as Dr. King was obvious in his giftings, just as he was able to gather and unify people together to bring a difference about in our nation, and to bring that God would lead a new leader into this midst to take us further in this area because it is our enemy that seeks to divide us. It is our enemy that seeks to try to create a, 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 a attention on our differences and hold us apart. But... We are, by God, made of one blood, all men. Amen? So let's pray together right now. Father in heaven, we just come boldly to the throne of grace. Lord, we ask in this generation that you would raise up another leader. We're so thankful for what you've done through Dr. King. But Lord, we are in need in our day, in our generation, of someone whose voice will be the voice of the Spirit speaking in this time to dispel the, the, the areas of darkness and fear that attempts to separate people. But Lord, give wisdom and understanding to guide us so that, Lord, there would not be division. There would not be a separation. There would not be all of these areas where there's tension in race relations. Lord God Almighty, the beauty of your creation may, us, may we see. But Lord, may you bring a voice in this time that will shake the status quo and help us to bring down the walls and barriers that keep us still apart and bring unity, resolution, and healing in our land. This we ask sincerely, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody in agreement with that say, amen. amen. Hey, guys, I'm excited. If, if you weren't here last week, we began a new series and you can always catch up on anything that's gone before. You can go online and you can, and you can um, see any of the services that are before. But we began a new series because why? There is a you God intended when he thought you up. In fact, the world desperately needs you to be that you. In other words, also listen to me. Your loved ones desperately long for you to be that you. And down deep, all of us truly long to be that you. And so in essence, God created us to thrive. What is thriving? Thriving is being able to receive life from without yourself, to create vitality within yourself, to produce blessing beyond yourself. It is God's design. It is God's purpose. It is God's gift to each of us. And so as we go into this, this year, what this series is called is you ain't seen nothing yet. In other words, there's more to come. You ain't seen nothing yet. God's not finished. Why? Because this is what this series is about. Becoming the best, God's best version of you. That's what it's all about. God had a plan in mind, and God is for you. And so this year, determined to become God's best version of you, allowing him to do in you what only he can do. You see, that's the purpose of redemption. That's what redemption came for, to restore the purpose and the plan that God had for you, to release you and allow you to become all that God designed you to be. Why? Because ultimately thriving is for a condition so that, so that you can be a part of God's redemptive plan. So that God can do things through your life to impact and influence our world. And so that's just a little catch up of where we went. Today, let's walk into this end. There is a reality that there is a you we are currently, and there's a you that is God's best version of you. So there's two separate aspects of it. And here's what we struggle with internally. 
It's dealing with that gap. The difference from who I am right now and who I ultimately want to be. The best me I can be. All that God intended for me to be. And the realization is we have to manage. We have to deal with that gap. And so in gap management, there's really, I thought about it, there's two ways that generally we go about trying to deal with it. The first one, some people, they fake it. They pretend to be something. They put on a great show. They go places, they pretend to have read things they didn't read. They pretend to have seen things they haven't seen. They talk about stuff they really don't know that much about, but they just kind of go through the motions. They pretend. And there's sometimes, there's a temptation that even a lot of Christians just come into church and pretend that everything is okay. They put on a great smile. They speak their best Christianese. They pretend that everything is wonderful. When in all honesty, down deep, they know that not everything is the way it intended to be. And so in essence, we can, the other way that we generally go about doing it, and more people trying to do this, is we try to work real hard at it. We try to devote ourselves, give our best ingenuity, our greatest efforts. You know, I just need to try harder, and then I can become the me that God intended me to be. But we can enter into what I call sometimes the insanity cycle. Look at it with me. What's the insanity cycle? I determine I'm going to try harder. And what does that do? That leads me to, if we're honest, fatigue. You can only try for so long. You work so much and then you figure, oh my goodness, is this really how it was supposed to be? And we get tired. We get faint. And then from our fatigue, it can lead us to quit. Say, I'm just, that's it. I had it. I forget about it. But after we quit, what can happen is, it leads us, we hear something, we read something, and all of a sudden we get guilty. And then what do we do? We try harder. And you go through this cycle. Because why? Go to the next slide. Look at this. We know this. There's God. Okay? And then we realize there's us. And before we knew him, what? There was this great gulf. There's this great barrier. Okay, it'll help. There's this barrier. There's delta between us. And we knew in salvation, what? You couldn't cross that by yourself. That's what religion attempts to do, right? We try to, we try to get across this game. We know God and man is separated through sin. And we couldn't bridge this gap on our own, could we? But what happened? We discovered what? Grace. Grace was the bridge that brought us to God. God built this bridge so that we could come to God. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but through his mercy, through his grace, God has provided the means. Now, after we begin to walk with God, what happens? Go to the next slide. There is you who is current. And, as we've been talking about today, there's the God's best version of us, okay? And then we realize there's a difference. Again, there's a, there's a difference between these two. But at that point, listen, why is it we attempt to try to do this on our own? When we have to, rec we have to begin to recognize is what? The means that God intended is grace. Because why? If you're taking notes with me this morning, listen. First point that you need to recognize is this. Is that God didn't just intend us. It'll come. God's plan is not just for us to be saved by grace. It is for us to live by grace. In other words, so often when you hear the message of grace, as a Christian, we're tempted to believe that that has to do simply with the sinner who needs to discover what Jesus has accomplished for him. That all of that God did for humanity, he did by grace. And the truth is yes. Could we save ourselves? No. Could we deliver ourselves? No. 
But why do we think after we have come to Christ that we can change ourselves, that we can transform ourselves, that we can accomplish the rest of the work on our own. And whether we admit that or not, we begin to fall into that trap of attempting to do what we're incapable of doing on our own. You see, Jesus came to do the first part, and Jesus promised us another member of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit would come to us. And that it would be he that would be uh, uh, invaluable to this process. It would be him that would be absolutely critical, necessary for us to be able to achieve it. In fact, look at this scripture. If you have a Bible this morning, turn with me to the book of Titus. The book of Titus. If you've never been on that, if you're not much of a Bible reader, listen, let me help you. If you find the book of Hebrews, just jump back. One, one, one uh, book. And it's actually, we say books, but let me help you a little as you're turning there. Listen, the New Testament really is a collection of ancient manuscripts. It just was collected together some 150, 200 years after the death of Jesus because all of these writings were so fundamentally important to the people, the followers of Christ. They were written by the leaders, by the apostles, and they were sent to the churches, and then they were collected later. And so Paul was writing to one of his disciples. Titus was one that Paul had raised up and sent to be a leader over churches. And Titus, he writes this to him. In Titus 3, 4, he says, And when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, verse 5, he saved us. Not because of righteousness or of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Aren't you glad? I love that scripture. I committed that to heart so many years ago. Because we're saved not by works of righteousness, not by righteous things we do, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting, now I study this, this is a part of my end of it. All of us can get into it learning that ever. The word renewal here is something that is not, it, it is a word of, of in, and this is unique to the Greek language, is that it is a word that is continuous. There is a constant working of the Holy Spirit in us because we were born again, we were washed, okay, washing of rebirth, we were born again. But yet there's a development, there's a growth, there's a process. That's what we're talking about in this series. That God, just as a seed enters into the ground and life bursts forth, there is still a developmental process so that it can produce fruit and continue to produce. And so the work of the Holy Spirit comes to help us. He's the the agency that brings about the new birth, but he's also the one that helps us to grow, to mature, and to be everything God intended us to be. So if you're taking notes, listen, this is the big idea for today. This is it. The only way to become the person God made you to be is by forming a partnership with the Spirit of God. Let me say that again. The only way. See, we can frustrate ourselves. No matter how hard you try, your efforts will fall short. Because you can't do what only God can do. You can try, but in in the end, it won't produce. The only way to become the person God made you to be is by forming a partnership with the Spirit of God. Forming a partnership. Now, Jesus spoke much regarding, but right before he left the earth, Jesus began talking to his followers strongly about the one whom he would send. He talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God, he said, I will not leave you alone. I will send you another helper. And it's interesting because the word helper that Jesus used with his disciples is the Greek word paraclete. Now, what that word is, it's a combination of two words, para. Now, we use sometimes the word para, we use parallel, it means to come alongside. The word para means to come alongside. And the word kleo is the, is the base word for kle. It means one who's called alongside to help us. 
One who's called alongside to help us. That was the role that the Spirit of God would come and play for us. Jesus said it was critical. In fact, he told his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem. After Jesus rose from the dead and he was heading back to heaven, he told them, listen, guys, remain here. Don't leave until you be endued with power from on high. Because the Spirit of God would come and empower us. Because the only way to truly live out the Christian life, the only way to truly become all God's designed us to become, is by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. Now, think about this with me for a moment. There are things we can accomplish in ourselves. I thought, I thought as I was preparing, as I was sitting down actually this morning, this thought came to me. You know, a builder, we used to build with normal hammer and nails, right? But anybody who's ever had any work, you ever done any work around your house? Anybody ever use power tools? What do power tools give you the ability to do? They give you the ability to do more than you could ever do, naturally speaking, with your own efforts, right? I remember a couple of, you know, a few years ago, we had an addition built on our home. And when the builder was out there, I saw the guy with the, you know, the nail gun. And just going, chew, 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 chew. I remember, you know, when I was like pounding nails, I would get probably one nail in and he'd probably be, you know, done with a whole wall. Because those are what power tools do. But let me give you the best illustration I can think about. When we moved into our home, okay, I had an 18-inch push mower, okay? Now, push by total human effort push, okay? And so we moved into a house that had about an acre's worth of lawn to cut. So when we first began, okay, when I went out there and I began to cut my lawn, it would take me, by the time I would finish throughout the whole day, because after my, you know, trimming and all the other things that I do, it'd be like seven hours. And my wife like, are you kidding? But yeah, it would take me that long to push, because it was a lot, you know, you had to bat, you know, undo the bagger and the whole deal, right? Eventually, guess what? I bought a riding mower. And what happened? It cut my time down. It made me do more. If you look at it now, did you ever see some of the ones that they got? They're huge. They have so much power. They could do what used to take me hours, okay, in 20 minutes or less, right? So what happens? What am I talking about? When the power of the Holy Spirit is working in you, not only does he give you more efficiency, not only does he give you the ability to do more than you could do to physically on your own, See, he came to empower our lives. He came to help us in the things. It was never intended by God for something to us to figure out how to do on our own. God gave us his spirit to help us. And therefore, it's forming a partnership. Now think about it. A partnership automatically brings about the idea of cooperation, doesn't it? A partnership means forming a relationship, coming to know and understand and allowing that to transpire. And so listen, two realities of forming a partnership with the Holy Spirit. Forming a partnership with the Holy Spirit, number one, that we need to understand, it's learning to submit to his leadership. Because the Holy Spirit in this partnership will always be the senior partner and never works the other way. You see, for you and I to experience the free flow of the Spirit's power in our lives, it is important for us to bring a right reality to the relationship God intended. Or, listen to me, some of you, you've been struggling too much on your own because maybe you have never even understood who the Spirit of God is. Maybe you have never even received Jesus told us, you see, subsequent to salvation, there is a separate working of the Spirit of God called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is available to every child of God. And God intended, it's what it came to empower us. And if you've been attempting to try to do this and muscle this and work this all on your own, I want to encourage you today that the Spirit of God has come. You can form a partnership with Him. You can be filled with the Spirit. You can be empowered by the Spirit. But you see, in that relationship, it requires us to learn to submit. And it's a learning process. Why? 
Learning to submit, why we def, what we struggle with, if you're honest. I mean, we are in church, right? To be honest, we all have struggles at times wanting to be in charge. We want our way. We want to do it this way. When someone says go that way and we want to go another way, we argue. We push back, right? But you see, there's a process of learning to submit to his leadership. The Holy Spirit will never force his way upon us. But Jesus said, I will send you, listen, it's important we recognize, number one, first, who he is. Jesus said, I'll send you another helper. The word another in Greek is the word alos. And it simply means this, another of the same kind. In other words, Jesus said, I will send you another comforter. One who's like me. In other words, the Holy Spirit is God. And he came, and that's why it's important to recognize God came to live in you. And God living in you, it is important that we learn to follow his leadership because he always knows the right way. He always understands what's best, but that's a learning process. Because trust me, I have learned over the years, the times when I've disobeyed, what I've, I, you know, when the spirit of the Lord has said something to me, I remember one of the very first times, trust me, I've always struggled. It's one of my struggles. God's still working on me. One of my struggles is driving too fast. Okay? And learning to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget. Driving up 91 one night. Okay? It was 11 something at night. I'm in my 20s. I'm cooking. Okay? I'm, I'm taking my Volkswagen Rabbit all the way to the can. Okay? All of a sudden, I heard a voice in my heart. Say, there's a police officer up around the corner, okay, just about a quarter mile up. You need to slow down now. I was like, that's interesting. <laughs> wow. As I continued to fly by, and as I flew by the cop, all of a sudden, I got pulled over. I got a huge ticket. And you know what I said to the officer when he handed me the ticket? I said, thank you for helping me know the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because you know why? I was an idiot. I didn't follow his leadership. Not only was he trying to, to protect me, he was trying to save me some money. The Holy Spirit comes to help you in ways you can't do on your own. But it's important because why? Look at the scripture in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide you. And notice the way he began this. Let. In other words, there's always a choice in the matter. The Holy Spirit will never take you over. The Holy Spirit will never make you do anything you don't want to do. That's why I laugh at the kooky people that say, the Spirit made me do it. No, you just had a freaky moment and your emotions got the best of you. Don't, pull, don't blame stuff on the Holy Spirit that's just, that's just plain weird. Okay. No, the Spirit of the Lord will never take you over, okay? The Holy Spirit works in us as we cooperate with him, as we work together with him. In other words, it's a decision, it's a choice. That, isn't that what relationships are about? Relationships require us to learn one another, to, to follow, see, Following the Holy Spirit is like the childhood game that we used to play. Follow the leader. It's learning in essence because he will guide you. Jesus said that the Spirit of the Lord, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. And listen, this is such an awesome promise that we very rarely even believe God for. He said he will show you things to come. Do you know the Holy Spirit will help you know things that will happen before they actually happen? if you learn to form a partnership with him. The Spirit of God, so he says, so let, the Holy, so let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You know, some translation, New King James says it this way, therefore I say walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Notice what the scripture says here. Whether in this version, in NLT, or whether in that, listen, it tells us that we're not to focus because here's where we struggle. We struggle with stuff we don't want to do. How many of you have ever promised yourself 
I'll never do that again. How many of you have promised God, I'll never do that again. Promise family, promise friends. Oh man, I'll never do that again. How have your own efforts been? You see, what happens so often is we struggle because we focus on what we're struggling with and we put all our attention on what we shouldn't do. And do you notice this? Following the Holy Spirit changes the whole dynamic. It takes it out of a negative context and puts it into a totally positive context. He said what? What? Walk in order your life. Follow the Spirit. In other words, concentrate on what you should do, not on what you shouldn't do. And you will find the success that the Spirit will lead, guide, and direct you in the way in which you should go. And when you begin to follow his lead, he begins to empower you. He begins to help you with the things you could never stop on your own. He replaces them. One of the best ways to help people break bad habits is to form a good habit, something that takes over something. And next thing you know, when you got used to doing something you should be doing, Something that you all of a sudden discover the power of doing. Something that gives you life that's great, that you love. All of a sudden you realize, wow, I haven't been really doing the other thing. And the Spirit of the Lord leads you. Because the attention and the focus isn't on what I don't do. But here it's in following the Spirit. So he says, when we do, it is important. And let me caution us in this end. It's so critical for us to learn to follow the Spirit's leading. Because in essence, my friends, he came. There are promises in the Word of God. Some, one, of, one of my favorite in Psalm 103, the Bible says, do not forget the Lord's benefits. Okay? And one of the benefits that it goes on to say in Psalm 103, because he says he forgives all our sins, he heals all of our diseases. He redeems our life from destruction. In other words, do you know one of the things that the Spirit of God will guide you to do? Save heartache. The things in your life that can be most difficult, most challenging. But it requires building relationship. It it requires coming to understand that, listen to me, God speaks to us through His Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Jesus said when the Spirit of God has come, not only will he lead us into he he shall not, this is what Jesus said, he shall not speak of himself, but whatever I have told him, that will he say, that will he speak, that will he declare unto you. In other words, the Spirit of the Lord speaks to us. You see, we're waiting for some booming voice, but no, it's just inside. It's just, it's, it's, it's a knowing. It's something internally that you just, the more you walk with him, the more you become conscious of his voice. The more you become conscious of his leading. The more, because he is, in essence, a gentleman. He waits for us to allow him. He waits for us to give him place. And it's important. And why is that not following the Spirit can cost us? I remember years ago, I'm, a, I'm an avid reader, and one of, the, one of my favorite testimonies, I read this years ago, it's one of my favorite, but a great man of God coming into the 20th century, his name was John G. Lake. John G. Lake, God had sent to, to South Africa, I mean, amazing the work that God did through his ministry there. But when he had come back, he, in his last venture of his life, he established a great church in Spokane, Washington, and, uh, and healing homes and amazing things, over a hundred thousand recorded healings by the medical community of what happened in those healing homes. But John G. Lake was driving on the, the road. You know, we call, you know, in California, that big Sur Road, you know, the one that goes along by the water. He was driving with his wife. They were going to be taking vacation. So they were going from where they lived in Spokane, Washington, down, okay, to California for a vacation time. And as they were driving along the road, all of a sudden he said, I heard a voice in my heart say, pull over onto the left side of the road into the, into the uh, ditch, into the side of the road. He said, you know, it was a beautiful day. There was not a cloud in the sky. The sun was shining. He said, there were no cars on the road. It seemed so strange. But he said, I knew that voice too well over the years to disobey him. 
So he said, immediately, I just turned my car. And he said, as soon as the last tire of my car entered into the, the path, you know, off the road on that end, immediately around one of those turns came an 18-wheel truck out of control, covering both sides of the road. No doubt would have hit my car and cast it over a cliff to my and my wife's sure demise. We would have been killed. You see, the Spirit of the Lord is there. I give you one more testimony on that end. Actually, no, listen. You and I need to hear his voice, to follow his direction. And secondly, secondly, is this. We need regular recharging of his power. Regular recharging of his power. Look at this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. It says, for this reason... We do not lose heart, even though our outward man, what are we speaking about our outward man? Our physical bodies, right? Our physical bodies is, is even though our outward man is perishing. Okay? Guess what? We're getting older. Our bodies break down, right? The more we do. That's just a fact of a fallen world, right? But he goes on to say, yet, inward, yet our inward man is being what? Renewed day by day day. In other words, there is an inward renewing. That's what the Spirit of God comes to do. Now, how many of you have a smartphone? Okay. Isn't it amazing what a smartphone can do? It's amazing. You can get email, you can text, you can FaceTime, you so much stuff you can do on that phone, right? But how many of you know as, much, as powerful of a tool that is, don't you have to charge it every night? What happens if you don't plug in your phone for a few days and the battery goes dead, right? What, can you use it? Can you benefit from anything that's inside of it? No, you and I need to recognize that although we have received the Holy Spirit, okay, we need in our hearts regular rechargings, regular refillings. You see, the Bible says that we were filled with the Holy Spirit when we get baptized in the Spirit. But there are necessities of regular rechargings. Why? Because in our human state, we leak. We drain it. And therefore, relationship, the Spirit of God. And that's why, as I have encouraged you so much, guys, that is why we need to have a regular devotional life. What do I mean by that? Time that we spend with God. Devotion meaning I devote time to God every day. That's God and me time. And allow the Spirit of God to begin to work in us because he charges our inner man. He brings about his divine power to accomplish the will and the work of God. He causes us to thrive and to grow. And so let me help you in these last three areas. How do we recharge? Three areas. Number one, we can recharge by praying in the Spirit. What is praying in the Spirit? Whether or not you've been baptized, the Bible teaches us that one of the things that God has given us by the power of the Holy Spirit to do is the ability, ability to communicate with Him beyond our intellect. The Bible calls it speaking in other tongues, praying in the Spirit, they're all one in the same terms. Here's the deal. When you and I learn to form partnership, you see, speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is about that partnership and operation. Because you can't without him, but he can't without you. Because why? It is our spirit that speaks by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when we begin to pray in the Spirit, when we do, the Bible teaches us that when we pray in the Spirit, we talk directly to God. In fact, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says, He who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men. In other words, that's the crazy part that people have brought out. Oh, no, that's not for today. Because that was to preach the gospel to people in foreign countries. Not according to the Bible. No, the Bible taught that he who speaks in an unknown tongue doesn't speak to men. But he speaks who? To God. In other words, we talk in a way and in a frequency that is totally outside the realm 
of anybody else's understanding, but our Father understands. It is a gift to you and I because it helps us to be able to pray about things we're unsure. We don't know how to pray for in our own intellect. In our own abilities, we fall short. The Spirit of God is there to help us. That's a part of his helpful ministry is that he comes along beside us and gives us the ability to pray limitlessly, to pray beyond our intellect, to pray in a perfect way directly with our Father in heaven because tongues is simply, this is what I call it, spiritual language. It's talking in the language of the Spirit. And when we do so, here's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says this, it's in your notes. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He who speaks in an unknown tongue, what? Edifies himself. Edifies himself. In other words, he builds, the word edify in the Greek language literally means to build himself up. In other, it's like charging of a battery. And every time you begin to pray in the spirit, your spirit is charged by the spirit of God. It's kind of like the more you drive your car, your alternator charges your battery in it. The more you follow the way of the spirit, he charges your inner man. And one of the ways we can do is by speaking in the Spirit. Secondly, is by staying filled with the Holy Spirit. By staying filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're what the Bible calls filled with the Spirit. But yet it is a continual process. Why? Look at Ephesians 5.18 says this. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead... Be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is interesting. Because when he says, instead, be filled, the, word, the two words, be filled in Greek, in ta- literally mean be being filled. Because in Greek context, it is a continual operation. It is something that is intended to happen again and again and again. Not to be baptized in the Holy Spirit again. In other words, once you got your smartphone, you need to go buy another. You have one. You just need to keep it charged. And so it is our spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, needs to remain charged, needs to remain filled with the Spirit. And so in essence, notice he, he gives this understanding of us where he correlates it, juxtaposition, he puts it to Drinking wine. Why? Because people who drink alcohol, you ever notice? What happens when people drink too much alcohol? They call it coming under the influence, right? In fact, if you're caught driving a vehicle and you have too much alcohol in you, what do you get? A DUI. Driving under the influence, right? And here, he, why does he correlate this? Because you and I, it's not that we need to, we don't need to get drunk, okay, and be under that influence, but we do need to come under the influence of the Spirit. Because when you come under the influence of the Spirit, in a lot of ways, what alcohol mocks, the Spirit of God, he helps you to deal with your fears, your insecurities, the stuff where you're, you're reserved and you're afraid and you hold back. No, he gives you the confidence, the boldness to speak, the ability to be who God intended you to be. You see, the Spirit of God helps you. And then he tells you how to remain filled. Look at verse 19. Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music from your heart to the Lord. How do you remain filled? Speaking. Speaking. And in this case, he says what? Psalms, hymns, spiritual song. Real simply. What's a psalm? A psalm is a spiritual hymn or a poem. Some people don't always like to sing. You can say, David wrote a hundred, almost, he probably wrote 120 of them. Not all of the, the book of Psalms was written by David, but he wrote a lot of them. But they're poems. They put them eventually to music. I don't know that he always wrote them to music. Maybe he did, because he was also a musician. But you can speak them. A, a hymn is a song that you and I know, a classic. You know, you can automatically just come from your heart and you can begin to sing. You know, like, great is thy faithfulness. Or how great is the Lord. You know, Chris Tomlin's and I call that a hymn these days because no matter where you go, people know that everywhere, right? And you see, what he's telling you is that when you encounter life's issues, 
you have two choices. Because what happens whenever you discover or come upon difficulties in life? We tend to talk about what? The problem. God said, how about yielding your tongue to the Spirit? And why don't you sing about the answer and the solution? Why don't you sing the praise of God? Why don't you allow me into the situation? Why don't you learn? You see, your heart, because you know that the more you talk about a problem, the more that creates in you worry, which is a form of fear, right? And the more you do that, talking about your problem, does that actually help your problem go away? You know what? The Bible says, come and magnify the Lord with me. What, do I, what does that mean? See, God is huge. God doesn't need to be any bigger, but sometimes to us, our problems look huge. And in those moments, we need to magnify the Lord. And how do you do so? Begin to sing about the greatness of his name. Begin to speak about the wonders of God. Begin to magnify the Lord. Open your mouth and speak the wonderful things of God. And if you haven't put it in your heart, then grab your Bible and even say what it says and say, I believe that you are the God who raises the dead. I believe that you're the God who provides for all my needs according to your riches and glory. I believe that you're the God who heals all of my diseases. I will not forget your benefits, O oh God. You know, that's what it means. So he says, when you do so, it keeps us filled with the Spirit. Last one, look at Last one is this, is allowing God's word to become life. You see, again, the importance of you and I developing a devotional life. And what does that mean? Spending time with God, both praying and in his word. Because something fascinating happens. When we begin to read God's word, the spirit of the Lord begins to allow the word to come alive inside of us. To produce and reproduce inside of us. You see, the Bible teaches us that it was the Holy Spirit that came upon Mary and she conceived and eventually Jesus was born. Jesus is the Word incarnate, okay? He's the Word who became flesh. When we allow God's Word to become alive in us, it means that now the Word of God is the lens in which we look at life through. In other words, when you see a difficulty, when you see a challenge, Immediately, your mind doesn't think anymore through the filter of, oh my God, I can't. No, you begin to look through a new filter that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, when you find yourself in the midst of a situation and you find people around you that are not, that are not nice, that are not polite, and you begin to look through a new filter when God's word comes alive inside of you, the Bible says, Pray for those who despitefully use you and abuse you. In other words, you don't take offense. You forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Your world begins to be formed and fashioned by what God said. And you begin to walk out the truth of who. Because becoming the you God designed you to be. It is about God's word coming alive inside of us. Look at this scripture. In Colossians 3.10 it says, and you become a new person. This new person is continually renewed in knowledge to be like its creator. See, the Holy Spirit is the one that brings it alive. It's the Holy Spirit that encourages us. It is the Holy Spirit that begins as we begin to obey him and walk out that leading, forms, fashions, and develops that inside of us. So think with me for a moment today. If you're here, have you developed a partnership with the Holy Spirit? Because to be the you that God intended you to be, to be God's best version of you, it requires us learning to recognize his presence, to realize his power, and to allow it to be in to form our lives, to fashion us, to empower us, to be able to be all that we can be. Because to live out that end, we need to begin to learn to submit to his leadership and be able to recharge by those ends. And all of that is available to you and me. So today, when I close the, the, the celebration down, up at the front, if you've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit, if you've never received subsequent to salvation the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, 
then I will have elders and pastors be down here to pray with you today. You can leave this place filled with the Holy Spirit. And now you learn the mechanisms of how you can actually stay filled. Because it's great when you receive. I remember when I first got filled with the Holy Spirit, it was like, this is amazing. But then I learned over time how to walk it out, how to remain filled, how to stay charged, how to stay vibrant and allow the Spirit of God. It's a lifelong journey, and that's what empowers us. Because in your venture, if it is your decision this year to truly thrive, to allow God to work in you, to do what only he can do, to become God's best version of you, the only way it's possible is when we allow the Spirit of God to work in us. Amen? Imagine with me for a moment if you simply today allowed the Holy Spirit to have a place in your life that you weren't. If you gave him control, if you said, I understand, Holy Spirit, you are with me. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I submit to your leadership. Guide me. Lead me. Help me to flourish and to grow. He's there with us always. Amen. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me pray for us today. Father in heaven, strengthen us today. Help us to have the courage and the boldness to live out the plan that you have for us. But Lord, not in our own strength. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. May today we be the glad recipients of the gracious third person of the Holy, uh, of the Holy Trinity, the Spirit of God, to play a role in our life that maybe we've never allowed him to play before. And to those that have, Lord, may we be encouraged to continue the journey, to walk the walk, to live out that reality of who you called us to be. Thank you, dear Lord for not causing us to be alone, but for allowing the Spirit of God to indwell us.